hello Hello. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, um, lady. Where is it? Can I go ahead? Okay, good afternoon, um, ladies and gentlemen. Sorry for the delay. The session was moved and moved, and then we had technical difficulties, of course, you know, because of the opening ceremony. Um, Ponce Lake, Silology, um, the CEO of Joko Labs Banjul, we are hosting, we are an innovative hub um, running out of Banjul, and we're also in um, eight other pan, um, African countries, mostly Francophone. Um, Joko Labs, we focus on building an environment for tomorrow's solution. That is our motto, and um, this session is going to be dealing with um, basically innovation and youth inclusion in the innovative space. We're very lucky today to have um, Commissioner Amani Abu Zaid. She talked about um, from the, the Commissioner for um, Infrastructure and Energy at the African Union. She talked mainly about um, us getting the whole continent connected. And we still know just one third of the continent is connected. Um, I, I have um, Madeline Lulegi, um, the Business Development Manager for Joko Labs Banjul. She should be online. She's been waiting for a long time. We should have also Navina from Policy Online and Teres Keita, Project Manager Joko Labs Online. In, in running this session here today, I have Zandiwi Asare, the, the chairperson of the South African IGF. And she's a young person. She's a, a lawyer, um, a digital advocate. And I have Toko Mia who is very instrumental in the youth IGF we're seeing here. And if you can see Joko Labs Banjo, we pride ourselves that 95% apart from me are all women, young women below 35. And my two panelists could also fall in that category. So without much about you, I will let um, Madeleine start with an introduction and um, she's going to talk about briefly um, what's happening within um, this space of innovation and um, inclusion, especially what Joko Labs does. If you notice, you cannot be talking about innovation and working with young people and just giving them digital skills without focusing on digital rights. Digital rights is important because they go hand in hand. Um, our continents today, um, we have seen how data protection privacy is important. So no matter what innovative tool you develop um, you, your ideas you are implementing. Always remem remember whether you're running training, whether you're a startup, make sure that that digital component, that online human rights are important. Those tools are necessary for our young people to know the importance and the ethics of what, what you do offline is also applicable online. So those ethics in all you do offline, you should also apply it online. Um, um, Joko Labs Banjo, we are running, we are a member of the Association for Progressive Communication, APC, which uh, is, an, is a member-based organization that focused on digital rights around the world. Um, and um, we are um, doing a program with youth inclusion that covers not only digital skills, but also involves communication and um, digital um, rights online and online human rights. So I'll start with Madeline. She will introduce herself. Then I'll hand over to Toko. And then Zanzinwi, I will take questions. And if um, Navina is online. So over to you, Madeline. Um, hello, everyone. My name is Madeline Ilalaji. I'm the business development manager for Joko Labs Banjo. Um, it's a pleasure to be part of this session uh, to talk on our work in digital inclusion, especially uh, since we're currently running a youth and digital inclusion project in rural Gambia, 
where we'll be training about 600 youths. Uh, the project has been supported by the Association for Progressive Communication, APC in Prague Grant. And the project focuses on cultivating digital skills and digital human rights knowledge with marginalized youth. Um, in the Gambia, we know that the youth make a population of approximately 60% uh, of the population is under the age of 25. Yes. And uh, since we've uh, realized that majority of the population is, is youth, uh, the need to ensure that um, digital inclusion is at the forefront of what they do to ensure that they are also using the tools so through our work in inclusion and advocacy to create better livelihoods for themselves and to also understand what their rights are when it comes to digital technologies. Um, the project uh, covers three main outcome areas adopted by the Association for Progressive Communication in the 2020 and, 2020, in 2020 and 2023, uh, which includes harnessing collective powers of communities, enabling digital inclusion for the most vulnerable, and promote governance of the internet as a global public good. Uh, so uh, in this project, um, we've already covered the area of uh, Upper River Region and the Central River Region, Basa in particular in the URR and Janjanbure in, in CRR through a four-day training covering the two regions and in information and content, content handling, communication skills, problem solving, online safety and digital human rights. We know that uh, the digital human rights uh, uh, was introduced by the UN General Assembly and UN Human Rights Council, and uh, it entails having the right to use any digital technology in an accountable, in an accountable manner. Um, this is done to ensure that digital technologies have a great impact on human life, both positive, such as the freedom of speech and negative rights, such as freedom for harassment, intrusion of privacy, and even violence. Through our work in this, we were able to teach young people in this region how to better respect themselves, how to better handle themselves online, and also know their rights as it regards to digital human rights with the use of the internet, especially with connectivity. Yes. Please, can I stop you a bit there? And um, I, I noticed your camera is not on. And um, I just want you later on, and I'll just give to Toko because we have to work on time here um, okay. to link what your digital rights program with your innovation program. And I think your camera should come in. So I'll hand over to Toko briefly. Please stay online, Madeline. And then yes. um, I'm with Toko. Thank you so much, Consulate, for hosting this session. Thank you for asking that I speak. This topic is particularly close to my heart because it represents a chapter of my life that has been the entire breadth of my professional career and is definitely not anything that I'm going to stop doing anytime soon. So I am Chokomia. I was exposed to technology at a very young age. Um, I built a website using HTML code when I was 11 years old and deployed it to a server. It was a, quite a unique experience uh, for me because I had at this point been a little bit of a gamer. My dad was a gamer and I was really close to him and I stayed, so, so I, I gamed. And, um, I have always had a passion and proximity to technology, but growing up, I realized that not everybody has that uh, and not everyone has the access either. Uh, fast forward to 2014, when I joined an organization called Girl Hype Coders in South Africa as their project manager. It's a nonprofit company and it is a business that is empowering girls in technology and entrepreneurship, coding and um, tech skills, digital skills, as well as inclusion. And in my time that I've been with Girl Hype, the one focus I've had has been on the experience of learning as well as the experience of being in the workplace. For me, there is nothing more invaluable than workplace exposure. And I've always included that into my curriculum. I teach girls between age 15 and 21, coding and technology. I, I focus on JavaScript 
for web and Android application development. And um, I'm a developer myself. In the time that I've taught, I've had a 100% pass rate. Bear in mind, I did not study computer science at university. But in the time that I've been teaching, every single student I've taught has gone on to study computer science at university. So that, for me, is a major success, just seeing the growth and seeing a young girl's mind change to see that you know she's become capable, she's able to do, and she's not scared because she's been exposed and, exposed and actually has been given uh, the right steps in the right direction. As well as this, I recently resigned from an organization called Younglings, which is a one-year learnership internship program where you learn and are challenged to start a career in technology. I have quite a number of experiences in technology, including the Technovation Challenge curriculum of which I'm a master educator. It's a mobile app competition based in San Francisco. And once a year, um, the competition runs over a number of weeks and the final teams go over to San Francisco. Um, for me, I definitely think that when we talk about youth and opportunities for youth, we need to think from a grassroots level because that's where we're going to be able to create the greatest impact and also to access uh, young, right? To get there well, um, generations are still young and um, I absolutely love the work that I do but that's just one one that's me in a nutshell and I look forward to to the sessions and to engaging and and, and um, dialogue around this thank you Toko very impressive as you can see these are young people doing the audience is young you know and um, it's also good to know how do we link innovation with the digital rights as a young person? Why is it important? We have an advocate here, a lawyer, um, a digital rights um, person, a young person who chairs the South African IGF. I dare to say she's the youngest chair of any African IGF. So, Zanzinwi, please, over to you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. And thank you so much, uh, Ponslet, for, for that introduction. Um, so I think, as, as Pons said, I, I am an advocate of the High Court of South Africa, and I specialize in ICT law. So that would be cybersecurity, data protection, telecoms. And I think what he's just said now, that between innovation and digital rights is definitely an arena that I, I, I advocate for every day. That's my pleasure. I have realized I wake up, eat, breathe speak any of this if any of you come up to me after the session we'll most likely find ourselves having that conversation and the reason that is um as young people um african young people especially i'm so glad that there's a majority of women in this room um we we find ourselves at a time where you can juxtapose or compare um the the gold rush the beginning of the gold rush to what we're experiencing right now with um, ICTs, technology, and, and, and the internet. And, um, you know, when the gold rush began, people needed to understand and they need to figure out how do we create revenue from this? How do we um, become the controllers of this commodity? Um, what, you know, is it really as valuable as, as what they say? So people were investing, people were skeptical. And what is beautiful about where we are in the beginning of ICTs is that we're not just trying to, um, you know, speak about how do we manipulate this? How do we make money? But we're also now having um, more human-based, um, compassionate, empathetic, um, all-encompassing conversations about um, inclusive innovation. So when we speak about inclusivity, there, there are elements that need to be highlighted. One, we speak about access. Access meaning that we also are including the most marginalized um, people of our society. So we've got young people, but we've got young people in rural villages. We have young people living with disabilities. We've got young people that have been forgotten. So we've got that element. The second one would be sustainability. What if we're doing from an innovative perspective, what we're doing to ensure that when young people get access to, um, to the tools that can creating innovative solutions as the environment around them. Uh, The environment around them, around us, um, 
you know, finessing us to, to thrive and to ensure that these solutions, that these innovative solutions that we create thrive, not just within this ecosystem, but globally, because that's exactly what ICTs give us. They give us the global platform. So I'll just give like a high, um, high level of what we do outside. I, I am a lawyer by profession. Um, however, I'm a CEO of a digital laws training company. Um, we do policy, we do framework, but we also do partner with um, global partners to create impact and scale. So for instance, um, we're working in Zambia currently with the Ministry of Technology and Science and the Ministry of Youth to um, bring in an AWS program to assist young people with um, getting certified for cloud computing. And that obviously opens up a world of, of work opportunities because we do know that at this point in time, in the next five years, there'll be a shortage for cloud computing skills. That's a global statistic. So if it's 80% globally, what does that mean for us in Africa where we, we already have our own dire deficiencies? So those are the kind of things that we need to be looking at. What are we doing to um, you know, pull strings from the global world? What are we doing to learn from probative things? What are we doing to co-create our own solutions? The people sitting here in this room, I know I've already got a business partner sitting on the left-hand side. She's not looking right now, but um, I do. <laughs> Hi, Mary. <laughs> um, where I do know that just based on the conversations we've had, there's so much synergy. Um, Tuka said something quite important. For us to even start with the conversation of innovation, and, and creating something, we need to be brave, we need to be open, we need to be able to talk to each other with, with you, you might say, look, I don't know anything, but I'd like you to teach me. Oh, I've, I've got this idea, but I think you can add this part. And I think that's what you're speaking about, Pons, to say, how do we now say, from a digital rights perspective, we embed that from a policy perspective. We speak with, um, you know, leaders, politicians, private sector, and say, we're young, we've got these ideas, we've got energy, how do we embed that into your business? How do we embed that into um, policy making um, regulations and say, look, for each thing that the government does, there needs to be about 10%, 15% of youth involvement. It's for us to ask those things. It's not for anybody else to fight for us. We should be our own voices. Thanks a lot um, for that. In, in the what I'm going to do now, you have listen to three people speak i don't know whether teres keita is online um the project manager of joko labs but i'm going to open it because i believe what i do when i work on innovation and digital rights i listen to the young people so i'm here it's my session but i'm going to get feedback from you and show these my three talented young ladies and if teres keita is online what questions? I'm happy you have the Malawi young people from, um, what's your program again? Digital, uh, digital inclusion and pain. So throw your questions. You have young people like you, young ladies, and I'm happy there are a lot of ladies here and then they'll ans answer your questions. Whatever you want to talk about in terms of innovation and digital rights and I'll make contributions as need be because it's better to hear from those who are actually in your generation than from me, who I might look at things from a different angle, but my feedback, my, my entire work life has always been listening to people and young people, especially that I work with and reacting to their needs based on the reality of our context. So you can, you can be the host. Thank you very much. My name is Esther Gomani, um, representing the Digital Inclusion Campaign. So thank you very much sir, also for the opportunity to speak. Um, we're running the Digital Inclusion Campaign led by the All Africa Students Union. It's running in 11 sub-Saharan African countries, including Malawi. They're working with a project team of four members. So we were required to train our colleagues here in Malawi on advocacy campaign which we did, and we have our team here. So going about the advocacy campaign on how we can engage with different stakeholders in trying to make our voice heard in terms of accessibility, affordability, and even availability of ICT resources, how would you advise us to go about the campaign and also to make our voice heard in terms of 
in, when we're engaging with different stakeholders now to make sure that they have heard our co concerns and also that we can take action in that. Thank you. Arlen, are you there? Yes, I'm still yes, here. I'm still here. Other Um, the, the, um, the audio content, it's very uh, uh, low. I'm struggling to hear the question that she asked and what you're currently saying. Can you please repeat your question? No, thank you very much, Madeline. I was, okay. Madeline, I was asking, like, we are running a campaign on digital inclusion and rights, right? Um, it's led by the All Africa Students Union. It's running in 11 sub-Saharan African countries, including Malawi. We had to train our colleagues here in Malawi on how we can go about the advocacy campaign. But now um, I'm looking at, we've been having different stakeholders come to our exhibition desk, asking what the digital inclusion is all about, how they would assist us. And as much as we've been trying to engage with them that we want to reduce data cost, we want uh, uh, accessibility of ICT devices and all that, how would you advise us as, you know, you've been in the innovation uh, team and all that, how would you advise us to go about this campaign? Thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you so much. Thank you so much for your question. Um, to answer that, um, since you have already identified the need areas so for the things that you need, the first thing you need to do when you were holding a campaign is to ensure that the people that you were targeting understand what you're trying to talk about. Do the specific areas that you're targeting with the youth that you want to work with, know what digital inclusion entails. Do they understand what their internet rights are? Do they understand um, or do they have basic digital literacy skills in order to be able to support the work that you were doing? So I suggest you first have a training on digital inclusion with them. Um, get to um, navigate uh, social media, what they can basically do with social media because uh, young people uh, in this present day and age, every one of us at least has one social media account or the other. Get to train them on those things. How can they use social media to conduct? How can they use social media to um, run their, uh, their businesses to co coordinate um, marketing strategies for small businesses that they want to use. Sorry, um, hold on a moment, my Yes, uh, apologies for that. Uh, yes, how can they better use social media to navigate their businesses, to better strategize their businesses and promote it for, for more visibility as well as to increase their means of livelihood. Also, I would advise that you also engage stakeholders or NGOs who are working in line with digital inclusion so that partnering with this organization, you will be able to get a different perspectives of how to run the different uh, digital inclusion trainings that you would you would want to, be, to, to coordinate. Thank you. Yes, thank you, Councillor. Thank you, Marilyn. I absolutely agree. I think at the core of what of the campaign that you're running, you have already identified your needs, and it's just about how you're going to execute the actual activity. The first thing you want to do is partner with partnerships overall. Get in touch with corporates. Get in touch with private sector businesses. Tell everybody what your intentions are in this campaign in advance. Your campaign is not a secret. So while you're planning, be open about it. Use social media to your benefit as well. Hi, everyone on my contacts list. I am planning a campaign around digital inclusion. I'm looking for speakers, right? So run your own campaign. And as much as you're going to teach others, 
be an ex be exemplary. The other thing is uh, corporates offer sponsorship models. You can approach them on their corporate social responsibility. You can approach them on their programmatic budgets and see whether there are any programs they're running that you're able to plug into. Um, there's so many people here as well today. So make sure that as many people that you talk to as many people, um, expert speakers, expert groups, and other organizations based here in Malawi who will be able to help you run your campaign. Um, as much as it's going to be digital, you also want to have that face-to-face -face connection. Also plan ahead. Your campaign has got to have is going to have an outcome. It's going to have recommendations and deliverables, and it's going to have a next, a few next steps, right? So be um, perpetrary of those next steps and be aware that there are other countries that are running the same project as well, and see how you can connect within your own internal and external networks uh, with your shareholders and your stakeholders and programmatics with each other to make the the campaign a success. Very much your question now, and then Zanzi will take that. So introduce yourself, please. Well, um, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Binesha Gamlete. I am the project, one of the project coordinator for the digital inclusion campaign, the data must go. Um, you know, I would like to um I had a similar question that my friend, that my colleague has already asked. So maybe it won't really be a question, it'd be rather maybe a comment, suggestion or contribution maybe, I don't know. So I think the challenge that we have in Malawi is that uh, implementation of some of the policies that are there or the enablers. So that is the major challenge that we have, but in terms of um, the innovation skills or the things that internet is doing for the youths, for young people like us is a lot because we rank different skills from the internet. Like um, we can learn on YouTube how to do nails and you can find that you're doing entrepreneurship through the internet. But then the challenges are that we do not have um, the data costs are high, and that is why we are advocating. We have been trained to advocate for the data cost to uh, reduce. But then the main challenge that we have is the policy implementation. Maybe there are policies that are there that uh, can, but the policy makers are not helping much on implementation of the policies or in, in order for us to achieve results or for effective um, digital accessibility, uh, affordability, and availability. So that is where we tend to get stuck. So maybe if you can assist us on how we can go about that. Thank you. At global level. online if you raise your hand online you're gonna go ahead and ask your question i will ask the question on behalf of sa remote hub hello south africa um the question is hi everyone question from south africa remote hub how do we collaborate with the game players in the ict industry to share the knowledge also support individuals and communities at large? So that's the question. Um, okay, I'm gonna give you a laptop. Right? So we'll just start with your, your question. I think it's a, a very important one, multifaceted. And I, I think, so let's first start, let's have a bit of order with our discourse, we might have a bit of a discourse. So 
your organization, how many young people are within your organization? Yeah, because I, I think this is an important one to have. Sometimes you need to understand because, you, you know, I, we can't just answer. We need to understand who you are, what you are, how you work, how many people, because a lot of these things, we need critical mass. We need all of us to hold hands, right? You can't be 100 youth or, you know, 50 youth, and then you think, oh, we're speaking on behalf of Malawi. If I was a decision maker who's got so many other things that are pressing because there's 5,000 people waiting outside for me and there's a group of 100, I'm certainly going to deal with the 5,000. But how many people do you guys have in your organization? Um, we have quite a lot. It's This project is run. It's the number. I'm not sure. Okay, so. All Africa Students Union is working with Malawi National Students Union Tax Force. And in Malawi National Students Tax Force, we have all university students that is from public universities. But how many are your active people? So when I say how your numbers, so for instance, I can tell you our youth task force is 21 of us. Mm -hmm. That's my number. What's your number? For the ones that are working on the DIC campaign, we have a number of 50. 30. Yes. Actively, if you say in a week's time we need to go and we need to campaign and write a petition, uh, sign a petition um, to say data must fall or we want young people to be heard, how many people do you believe your organization can call? Even 3,000. Even 3,000? Yes. So the fact that you have that 3,000 answers your question. That's how you get people to listen to you. You get your numbers. But your numbers shouldn't just be people who are filling seats. Your numbers should be people with substance. Your numbers, you said, you said something, how do you policy, what policies are there? You shouldn't be asking us, you should be telling us our policy says X, Y, Z. In order for you to keep people accountable, you need to know what they've promised you. They promise us through their policies. A lot of the times, I mean, I've been doing this for a couple of years now where I address other young people like myself. Um, in South Africa, we had a big thing where a question or the narrative was being posed that the constitution needs to be reformed. I asked a crowd of almost 500 young people who were saying they need this constitution to be changed. I asked them who, by show of hands, have read this con has read this constitution, even if it's just three chapters of the constitution. Few people raised their hands. As young people, we should stop in talk shops. We should actually go do the work, do the research. And in Afrikaans, one of the languages speaking Afrikaans I mean, in South Africa, they say, "Dun bogies back." Bogies back is sit on your bum open that book, that laptop, and do the research. So when someone comes to you, you should say, but your policy says this, and I don't see it. Until you become so meticulous in your research, in your wants, in your needs, people will not take you seriously. And I think that's um, been our intergenerational conversation where we've been criticized, especially us, I don't know, 90s babies, I think most of us are. Um, you know, 90s, 2000s, babies with they just say we are instant babies we're, we were born with microwaves you put noodles in two minutes is out and that's you know and there's nothing wrong with that that's what we know right we don't go to libraries with encyclopedias we google we, we we download and it's in the comfort of our home so we want things fast but some things actually need us to do that so you need to be able to say policy says this this is where we want him that's when even an older person who's in leadership is going to look at you dead in the eye and say, you know what, you know what you're talking about. I want your guidance. I want your leadership. We need to be able to fight smart, have scientific approaches to what we do, be able to put two things together and say, this is what was said. This is what was missing. But the next step for us to be speaking about innovation and solution making is to be able to say, and this is what our suggested solution is. If you can put those three components together, not just your leaders in Malawi will be listening to you, but global leaders will be listening to you because what you say has substance. So that's, I, I don't know if that answers you to some extent. It's about your numbers, critical mass, substance. And those things are powerful. You yeah. of nowadays, like of our, our day, we need to understand that the, the leapfrogging into leadership and the kind of impact we can create is astronomical compared to our predecessors. So we need to remember the power that we have. So that's the first one. The second question was, how do we 
collaborate. Um, and I think because it's South African, we're having a Malawian crowd, actually we've got like a, a, a regional crowd. Um, I think it's just the openness and coming to these kind of forums. Um, you'll see, Maria and I are gonna do magic very soon. I know that, right? Maria rather. And it's about being brave and it's about being open. And it's also about having that pan-African mentality. We've got the African Continental Free Trade Agreement that's 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 you know being chatted about and all that. You need to ask yourself as a young person, what am I going to do to one get a piece of that action to be at the forefront of it? And it comes to regional collaboration. So um Toko, I think she can even speak to this. We've got a WhatsApp group specifically for um now that we're creating for youth um IGF members because obviously we're part of the entire ICT ecosystem. We come with our different skill sets. It's about being able to be part of those groups. We find each other, we're not shy, we speak. Hi guys, I need X, Y, Z. Who has that skill set? Okay, let's let's work. Barriers of borders should not be the things that are closing us apart. So I think it's about using the data of our numbers and being able to put that together and having those open conversations. I don't know if that's answer, if I, if I answered that sufficiently. Yeah. Yes, the question from the South African Hub. Thank you so much for that question. And um, it's it's really great to see your own country in in sessions and 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 supporting. So that thank you for that. Um, in terms of, um, I would definitely say again, it's about the game changes. Can we just have that question again? Okay, question from FI Remote Web. How do you collaborate with the game players in the ICT industry to share the knowledge, also support the individual and community at large? You know, I love this question because it's so easy. You know, the organizations, game changers, whether it's corporate, private sector, government, civil society, NGOs, advocates, activists, professors, academia, People are waiting to assist. They want to help. You just have to provide the realistic and reliable method and vehicle for that help, right? Um, it, it, we recently had in South Africa a Youth Internet Governance Forum Outreach National Regional Initiative, right? For the very first time, South Africa had a specific IGF activity geared to and for youth. Getting this activity off the ground was, in the, we were in the exact same position. We had two or three interested bodies, five, five to 10 interested bodies, and had to get started from zero. There's no, there's no branding, there's no website, there's no social media page. Nobody knows that we're interested in this activity. But we had the greatest ease organizing because organizations are already interested in because they've experienced the problems that you're outlining, right? So for a simple email, take action. You know, stop procrastinating. Youth, youth love sleeping. <laughs> stop. Don't do that. Wake up at 5 a.m. Have a routine. Be disciplined. Get up. Start your day. Do that every day, seven days a week and make sure that every single day you're working. That's what it takes. Okay. Realistic partnerships and proposals. Get, get out there. Send, send word that you're working on a project. Uh, put together a proposal. Put together a concept note. Send, put together a, a deliverable email that's going to have a high level a CEO, a, a founder, a professor, an HOD, have, have an email address that's actually trustworthy, somewhere to direct people. Before you start any activity, you should have enough research. You should have enough documents on your database. At, at the point that you're inviting me to the conference to speak, I shouldn't ask you for a program or ask you for a social media handle or a link, and you haven't got that information to, to give to me. I won't want to speak. I'll decline politely. And, um, you know, I think that 
is the key. People want to assist. Know what you want, know your needs, and don't go for anything less. When you when you ask for for castings, when you ask for 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 direction, don't go for anything less. Um, these are really important factors to have. So to South Africa Milk Club, I say, whatever it is that you are wanting to do, go for it because game changers are as active as you are. Be prepared and submit. That's what it takes. something that has, uh, that has saved the sense of innovation is um, small steps. If you look back in my day, you people didn't experience this, as in, as in we said about um, your digital natives. All of you were born in the 90s or 2000s. So you're all digital natives, born with technology, born with microwave, born with everything. Back in the day, when you are applying for a visa, most of you young people will travel or have traveled and you, are, you are apply for a visa. You, you fill a paper-based form. You go to the particular embassy, if it's the British embassy, like when I was going to university, pick up the form, you fill it. And like me, that didn't have good handwriting, you have to write in caps so that it's clear and everything. At that time, there was no email address. Then they tell you, you have to go and drop it at eight at eight o'clock in the morning. Hmm? So they have told thousands of people that. So you have to wake up early, maybe go six o'clock or sometimes five o'clock, depending on the country. Some countries people go four o'clock, you know, and wait in line, you know, and you go through this process. But what happens now? All embassies, including the Malawi government, have all to make it their visa processes. Today, you want to book an appointment to any country. You do it online. They give you a time slot. So if they tell you to come 12 o'clock and you know you're not going to work or going to school that day, you chill in your house. You, ca you calculate the number of times. Maybe you're taking a taxi or you're driving that, that it will get to you. Are you, on the, are you seeing how things have um, um, automated themselves? There are countries like Panama, Costa Rica that know that, okay, we are a small country how um, people want to visit us for tourism and different things, but how do they get to us? What did they do? They piggyback on other countries' visas. So if you want to go to Costa Rica or Panama, they just say, if you have a British visa, you can come to us because they believe the British visa, they have good, done a good background check of you, or if you have a US visa, or if you have a European visa. Malawi, as a small country, what did you do? The COVID made people react to have an e-visa process, you know? So you look at the things that we take for granted. Those are the things, looking at the ethics, looking at the digital rights components of them, those are the things that really make a difference. I'll take, tell you an example back in the Gambia that I always tell young people that I'm sure it applies to several um, African countries. Anytime I'm driving to the capital in Banjo, I see this thing that the capital of Gambia. I see this thing that always makes me cry inside. You see a lot of women with their babies. No matter how early I go to Banjo, if it's 7 o'clock, 8 o'clock, 9 o'clock, they are with their babies work, um, waiting at what they call um, the polo clinic, where they do vaccinations hmm? for, for baby vaccination. Newborn, so whether it's two months, three months, I, I, I don't know, you know, after birth. So they are there, their mothers are with them. Some of them, you're driving back. I've gone for my meeting. I'm driving back. I still see a mother that I saw maybe 9 o'clock. She's still there by 12 noon with her baby, maybe, and the sun. I mean, you, 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 you guys got good temperature. I'm telling you now, we are, we are plus 30 in Gambia. You, you can imagine a woman. You don't know where she's come from. Now, what does it take with all the digitization process going on in Africa? We saw our commissioner, Amani Abu Zaid, say, we, talk, we saw your minister saying it. What does it take for young people to just develop an app and say we are giving it to our public hospital to say, okay, you doctors, you nurses, you know when your vaccination time is. Before all these mothers are coming, let them download this app, book their time slots. First, 
30 people, their time slot is 8 o'clock to 9 o'clock. So mothers don't come there waiting with their babies under the hot sun and all kinds of um, unnecessary things can affect them. So if you check all our public health centers across Africa, you have similar instances. So there are a lot of things we can easily automate. In this conference today, we saw the time changing. If we had an app, would it have not made life easier? Uh, a conference app that is, is, is changing. Our online audience are checking it, are checking it, are checking it. So we have to look within our context and remember that anything we'll do, we should think of tomorrow. We should look at the African agenda of what we want. There are 10 pillars. I said in yesterday in one session, I'm 54. I don't think I'll be around the 2063. It will be a miracle. And that we all will die. It's just the time. But in all, um, to be realistic, I'm not going to be around in 2063. Most of you will be around in 2063. All things being equal because you are in your 20s and stuff like that. The, the African agenda 2063, those 10 pillars, the first ones had with high speed rail. The last one, the tenth one, deals with building an e society. You look at that e society when 50 years of the African Union, you come from 1963 or 60 or 63 or so, to when the African Union was formed and when they did the next 50 years of the foundation of our body. What is going to happen? This e society has all started now. And a lot of them has been initiated by what? Who can tell me? What has initiated? This rush, uh, um, we, we saw them talking about the digital transformation for Africa. We saw this program. What, what has made this rush important? The pandemic. As this one thing I saw on TikTok, when you say something, they say it shocked you. So the pandemic has shocked us, <laughs> isn't it? So everybody is reacting now. Everybody's reacting. We are reacting. Our governments are reacting. You two are reacting. You see our, you see our minister, he was talking today about all the things he's doing, things are in progress and everything. And you saw the president, what he said. He said, it's Africa now. We should think of those solutions. So I would like, um, if we don't have further questions, I would like um, Madeline to give a closing remark. And I want you to think about research, to go talk about research, have evidence-based data. Don't just, like today in this session, when someone was saying about affordability, that, oh, devices uh, devices are expensive uh, mobile devices and everything and we are importing every quarter in africa 30 to 50 million mobile phones is it the chinese using those mobile phones it's africans using the mobile phones out of those 19.5 million are smartphones every quarter that's the first so you tell me how many mobile devices, if you go to any African village, and that is a fact, you will see someone whose business is charging phones with a generator. You can even have a village that you can go and buy a generator and put it there in your grandmother's house and say, grandma is charging phone or develop solar system. And you, 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 you know the amount of money you're um, making on the, 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 the catcher, whether it's you're charging hundreds to charge phones. So a lot of people just think that, oh, people are sitting there, um, oh, because uh, they are poor and they have mobile. Because the average African, no matter how poor he is, have realized that they have to communicate. Market women communicate. You know? And once we realize that, we that we think we are educated, no, we are making a big mistake. But if you think you know, you know not. Go and check how the average man is living in the village. What he's doing with communication. How you think your grandmother, at the, at the same time, he has, a, he, has a, um, he has a nephew in the United Kingdom sending her money and she's receiving it in WhatsApp and she's speaking the Malawian language and receiving everything. And once they send her the message by Western Union, she's shouting and she can do that. So those people we think, they are not digitally included, they are included. It's just that we have not reached them. And we should try to create solutions for them. When we create solutions for them, then 
you will make money, you will look at the policies that you are talking about, because your, your president talked about all these things, your minister talked about all these things, all you young Balawians here. So the policies are there. Have you acted on the policies? You say data must fall. How will data must fall? Have you gone to check what policy since that's your slogan? Anyway, I don't want to talk too much. This is not my show. This is the show about young people. So I will hand over to Tuko to give her closing remarks and Madeline will end last. Okay. I have worked in a number of youth empowerment initiatives, um, including one run by the president of South Africa, Sol Ramaphosa. Um, one of the things I do, I am the founder and CEO of my business development. We've got an SME startup growth uh, curriculum, which is online 12 weeks to start a business in 12 weeks. And as such, I am a service provider for a project called Yes For You, which is the a rollout of an internship for every South African youth, anyone over the age of 18 is able to get it. And over the course of that month, you get a stipend, which is quite significant. At the moment, it's about 4,200 rand per month. You get it once or for one year over the course of your life. And in that year, you can work in a business. And as you're working in that business, you're getting paid by the government, by the state. This project started by the president and then um, you gain skills from your employer. Right, so I'm an employing provider to this program. I work with young people every single day. Um, currently, all of my employees are interns. Okay, and one thing that I stress in my office is capacity development. The programs are great, but at the end of the day, youth are going to have to stand up for themselves. Each and every single one of us has to stand up and create the kind of impact that we want to see in the world. Um, so I'm going to talk about the fact that the, the, the program that we have here, the, the initiatives that we have here are all inclusive and are, are, are able to be rerun in not only our businesses, but in your businesses going forward and, and, and the businesses and communities that you impact. So it's up to each and every single one of us to work together in that um, in creating, as Ponsolid mentioned, the future that we want to see. We've got to look with our two eyes and inquire and be inquisitive and see what that society, that future society looks like and future-proof that society and build for us the kind of landscape that we're looking at. So in this conversation, I would just like for everyone to put on a brand new lens and it just take the context of where you're going as opposed to where you've been that didn't work for you going forward. Um, that is the most important part of how we can trust Africa to actually build programs and opportunities for you. Um, okay, so mine will be very short. Uh, so we, we spoke about innovation and digital rights. So I think it's also important for Africans to, young Africans, to, to do the hard things. I'd really like us to, when we think of innovation, um, to think about artificial intelligence, to think about machine learning, to think about um, data processing at a national scale that could have global impact, um, to, to really do the hard things. You know, it's easy to just, you know, to, to, to speak about campaigns and, and, and to, to make noise, but when it comes down to doing the hard work, to, to realize that those digital rights that we're speaking about um, are connected to the hard things, right? We need to be the ones that, when we're speaking about artificial intelligence, we're ensuring that we're breaking down, um, you know, issues like, like um, algorithmic bias. You know, we need to understand what that means. We need to understand that as Africans, we're creating solutions that serve us but that really requires doing the hard work. So that's just my um, my parting words to the hard work. Thanks. So that hard task is important. We get people involved in all this internet of things, artificial intelligence, blockchain, read, read, read. You have all these tools there. So Madeline, 
your concluding remarks and if anybody has anything to say to conclude i'll give the audience to conclude online or offline so madeline over to you okay um thank you once again for being part of this uh, wonderful panel discussion on youth and innovation uh, just like uh, michael panelist said we have to keep collaborating with each other and keep learning to better create opportunities for young people but in as much as we're also trying to do that we have to also ensure that we are uh, also giving back to disadvantageous communities by helping to better build a community where people everywhere know what their rights are about, have equal opportunities and are able to utilize the tools at their disposal to create a better continent for Africa where solutions are offered to people in an inclusive way so that we can better strive to create and promote collaboration as well as build an Africa that is fit for all of us. Thank you. within the space of the internet governance take part in your local in it has to be bottom top there's a lot of national initiatives your minister your president talked about look at what is happening national look forward work as a group some of you should come to my um, to addis ababa it's not far it's two hours plus it can be done you can be able to mobilize funding you know don't just sit down and say yeah you yeah okay yes <laughs> so okay just just on that i am a youth internet governance coordinator for the united nations uh, internet governance forum taking place in addis ababa the day is going to be the 28th of november to the 2nd of december please go online and have a good research on the internet governance forum happening this year and the topics there are five pillars for this year but furthermore travel support and funding is available right now on the website so Please, I encourage every single one of us in this room to please fill out our application forms for travel support uh, to attend the Addis Ababa IGF. And looking forward to seeing everybody there because this conversation is not going to end here. Also, we also look for local support because this is charity begins at four. Um, I was very happy your Airtel were, were here. Hmm? Airtel were a funder. Um, Airtel now are now aware you people are doing data must fall. Mm? Issues that are concerning young people. So those are the things that have to take place. So thank you, everybody. I want, I want to thank my, um, she was my lecturer at Diplo, um, Mawindi. Please, Mawindi, stand up. She, she, is an, she, she is one of those that if you need training on internet governance, she's been a pioneer with the Diplo Foundation and then I have an office in Nairobi. So you, you you can reach out to her as a young person she will advise you and thank you to my online um, audience and i'll just close madeline is actually my daughter so you see she's learning you know so it's good yeah it, it's good to have um young people um like that and you can encourage more young people to join so god bless you all enjoy the rest of the day and we'll see tomorrow somewhere sometime in malawi god bless you thank you